Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone enjoyed their lunch. Uh, my name is Derek Ramsey. I will be moderating this afternoon's session. Uh, this session is Sakai Lessons, Julianne's favorite, seven favorite things online. She's going to be talking about some features and lessons uh, that she enjoys using, and hopefully you will find them uh, to be useful for you as well. Uh, during the session, if you can please leave yourself muted. Um, feel free to use the chat to ask any questions. I will monitor that throughout the session and bring them up to Julianne uh, throughout the session. Uh, Julianne, would you like me to bring them up as they come in? Or do you want to save like a Q&A for the end? What works best for you? Um, I'll try to keep my eye on the chat as well. Okay. And uh, we'll just do our best. And if I miss any, please definitely take note of those. And, I'll, and we'll talk about them at the end. That'd be great. Okay, sounds good. Uh, go ahead and get started. All right, let me get my share screen here. All right, let me get my chat open too because I just said I was going to monitor it. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming to my session. Um, can someone just put in the chat that they can see my slide that says seven favorite things? Okay, thank you. Um, so my favorite thing about Sakai is definitely the lessons tool. I spend so much of my time in the lessons tool. I've made live streams of myself just doing editing in the lessons tool. They are very popular. I'm about to go viral on YouTube. For sure, you're going to catch me next to um, some of the more viral YouTubers because it's fascinating. But I love doing it. And I love showing um, just all the different functionality you can do with it because in my experience, just using other platforms at this point, um, I know the amount of customization and flexibility offered by Sakai and especially the lessons tool. And I think it's such a powerful feature that I really want to just showcase the seven things. I had to pick seven. I had to limit myself. The seven things that I find myself using the most frequently and that I want to share with others and just examples like essentially of of each of them. So um, like I said, I kind of really like lessons a lot. Um, I, I I am using another platform right now and building content into it that's not Sakai, and I'm finding that I'm missing so much from Sakai when I'm using this other platform. Um, I am missing the ability to have different elements on a page, to be able to sequence students through a module in a way that reflects my course design. Um, I'm missing the ability to add customization and personalization to my content in my course. And I'm going to showcase some of those features that have that ability that you miss in other platforms. <laughs> I will not be naming it. <laughs> that shall not be named. Um, and then I also find that there's a lot of times confusion over how best to use a lot of these features because they do offer so much flexibility and customization. So I think it's always great. And this is what's wonderful about the Sakai community is that we can share examples with each other and I love this conference every year because we get to see how other people, how other schools are doing things, and it gives you all these ideas. And so I have examples that I've just pulled from all these classes that I've worked on. So you'll see a lot of those throughout this presentation, and some of them might look a little bit different than what you might have known you could do in your LMS, your version of Sakai. Um, and I'm not going to kind of go into the too many of the weeds of how to do a lot of these things, but for most things you can do them. You just maybe have to know a little bit of code or just have a little bit of tweaking in some of the settings. Um, and uh, hopefully I don't get anything too crazy, but if you have questions, um, feel free to ask me at the, at the end. And then also I'll be able to answer questions outside of this session as well. Um, it really just makes me also feel so good to be able to take an instructor site who they they followed all the rules. They thought they did what they thought was best. They kind of like looked at all the available features and lessons. Um, but sometimes they just could not get everything conveyed that they need to get conveyed in an organized way. And so I they come to me as an in in instructional design capacity. I look at what they have, I hear what they tell me about their students' comments and feedback about their course, and then I love to take that feedback and do like a before and after essentially so here's what your course was before and then here's what it looked like after and usually that has resulted in um students having a lot more positive things to say about the course after the fact and i think they have a much greater learning experience because they are able to find those materials so much more easily without having to dig for resources um and and clarifying instructions and it just gives me such joy to do this and so it's my favorite thing to do in my job 
Um, so I'll be showing some examples kind of starting now. Um, so the first thing we're gonna start with is templates. This is absolutely my favorite thing to use in lessons. And it's actually not just restricted to the lessons tool. It's actually in the text editor of Sakai. So even if you were to post an announcement, you could click on this templates button and it would pull up the, the menu of template options. I mostly use it in the lessons tool, but I have used it in other tools, um, but it's, what, it's one of the ones I definitely use the most. So when you click on the little templates in the text editor, and your text editor may look a little bit different depending on which version of Sakai you're using, um, but it pulls up this menu of templates, and it's just a quick little button push to get something that looks like this. So I have, um, in this case, I have something called an instructor, I think it's actually called an instructor conversation, but we sometimes call it instructor insight. And it's a professor who's teaching in teacher education course, and she's sharing her personal experience. And I didn't, I couldn't quite show this very nicely on the page, but it's embedded right next to the content of her course. So she is explaining her her story about teaching. It draws in personalization with the content of that week and how she has. Um, developed her expertise as a professional. Um, I'm also using the learning objectives one and an important dates one. The important dates template might not be available in your Sakai, um, but it's something that we did add as a customization. So this is again, why we love Sakai, Sakai so much is that we can just keep adding more and more features that meets our instructors and our students needs. So important dates was one that we kind of just we just decided we need to have that. And so it's a one button click and then instructors can fill in the date that they want and then the assignments that are coming up for that week. So here's one where I do have um, just a kind of a, pic a screenshot that shows sort of a lessons page. It's hard to get a good screenshot, um, but here I'm using, I think it's the star, the star template. If I change the star to a calendar, because I got tired of using the star, I try to be very tactful and strategic with the way I use my templates. And I try not to overuse them for one, but then I also try very carefully to change the colors or have like, if I'm doing something that's a call out for a specific date, I'll, for that course, it will always be teal in this case, and then it'll always have a calendar icon. And I'm only using this when I need to specifically call out something that is different than what the students have been um, accustomed to seeing in previous modules. So I, I just, because sometimes you do have to have changes, you can't be consistent at all, all times. This is one where I've shown, um, I'm just trying to draw their attention to a date change that will help them stay on track for this module. And then I'm also, <laughs> we're trying to keep, uh, I'll, I'll make a note to contribute the important dates um, one. That's definitely a good one to have. Um, the team leader best practices, I think this was actually an originally an instructor insight template that again, I just kind of took out the picture with just a couple little bit of code things and it's code that you can do, I promise. I changed the background color to gray and I changed the header color there to be this kind of purple color. And this is a just a reminder anytime these students in this class have group work, a reminder of what they're expected to do as being part of the group. So they don't have to go back to the syllabus. So I really don't want students having to go back to the syllabus that much. I try to pull that information out to where they're gonna need it for their assignments. So again, I'm just using templates here. I'm trying to be judicious with them, but it's definitely something that I'm sometimes getting a little bit too template happy because even even actually if, you were, if this were a real lessons page, you'd scroll down and you'd see that I did use another one because I needed to but they are so useful and it's just one button clicks and there are customizations that you can do. You don't have to just rely on the gold star or the gold little or the little warning box. You can change those colors and make it your own. It's very easy to do. This is one, I just mocked this up for this presentation. So this is not in a real life course or anything, um, but it also inspires creativity. These templates can inspire you to be creative. So this is just using these in, um, conversation templates. And so I'm just playing it out as if I were teaching an astronomy or a physics course or anything like that, or engineering, I might have my students kind of think about the debate between um, why we're moving back towards a capsule for our space flight now versus the shuttle that we had um, earlier this decade or last decade, I suppose. Um, so I'm, you can be really creative with it. It kind of gets you to motivate. It kind of just inspires you to think outside the box and make your course more interesting and more engaging for your students. Um, I've seen other instructors who've kind of played this out with like a little fake student or they've pulled in characters from their favorite movie or TV show. Um, it's really, I even had, I was even mocking up one where I had like four, I had like Pluto having a conversation with Saturn and Jupiter with Ceres. So there's like different ways you could do this, but it's fun to kind of just make your content more appealing to the students. 
The last one, this template, if we, we did not, I don't think, share this one back. It's called Marianist Principle, but I do want to call it out. It's the template that we have here at University of Dayton because we're a Marianist university. And right now we're really trying to focus on the value of a Marianist education. And so we can just put this into someone's site. So it gives you the Marianist logo, which is a um, Catholic order, I think. Please don't come after me if it's not actually Catholic order, but um, they do have these charisms and it's something that we do hold in value here at the University of Dayton. We often talk about the charisms of the Marianist education. Um, and so we have um, many reference materials throughout UD about what it means to be a Marianist educator, what it means to have a Marianist learning experience. And so I'm always referencing those and then connecting it back to the content. So this Marianist principle is in a teacher education course where their students are learning about how to educate um, students who, for whom English is their second language. And so I'm trying to pull in that this Marianist principle of um, making sure that we're inclusive in our education and making sure that everyone's holistically learning. And uh, it's a quote directly from that document and you have a link to it right there. So this is an example of just like, I don't think you can do that in other platforms as easily, but it's a button that an instructor can just press and then they can connect their content to these Marianist principles and it makes it a UD education. The next thing, so I spent a lot of time on templates um, because that's my favorite one, but the next thing are sections. Um, and so we kind of talked about this a little bit in the last session, this, these um, expandable and collapsible section breaks. I know some folks in Sakai don't use them as much. Um, it, I think there may, they maybe are not accessible, keyboard accessible. Um, I think that's something that's being worked on maybe. <laughs> but in any case, I use these all the time really to just help break up content and organize content. Um, sometimes I'll start them collapse. Sometimes I'll start them um, open. It kind of just depends on what it's called for. I think probably more often than not, I'm starting, I'm having them all be collapsed when you first load the page. Um, but then there's a, different ways to break up your content and it does reduce that cognitive load for students as Sarah had mentioned in the last presentation. It can be overwhelming and also very long on your scrolling finger to scroll down across a page that doesn't have those um, collapse those collapses set. So for us, we do use them here at University of Dayton. Um, so here's just an example of how to organize your, your content um, via units. So I have a unit one section, I have a unit two section, and there's more down the page. And then within each unit, there's um, sub pages for each module that has all the items they need to complete. Um, this is another example where I have, um, I'm organizing by module versus by unit. And if I were to expand one of these, it would show you all the tasks they need to complete for that module. This allows you as an instructor to have all of your content on one page. So I do, because this course doesn't have as much going on in it, I have a one page system for this class so that they can just quickly get to module 16 and see everything they need to. There's not 16 modules in here, but there, there could be. Um, and sometimes that's an advantage versus having lots of different sub pages, although sub pages have their place, don't get me wrong. But sometimes if there's not that much content, you wanna have a one page kind of system here. And then I also do have it split up between clinicals. So they kind of have these five modules of content and then they go into clinicals and I use color here, which I know you shouldn't always use color or just use color to signify meaning, but that's what the words are also for. Um, but the, the color difference between these two sections, um, uh, between the modules and the clinicals helps students visually kind of make a break in the, in, in the uh, structure of the course. So they kind of know just by looking at this at the, when they first log in that, oh, I have clinicals after module five. And that just kind of gets in their head and helps them remember that as they stay on schedule for the semester. Um, <laughs> Josh asked, what's the place for subpages? Oh, I mean, Let's see, uh, do I have a good sub page here? So here's the case for sub pages. So I have my units, right? And then within each unit, I have module pages. So within each of those pages, then I break out all the content. And on each module page, I have um, like more expandable and collapsed sections for each task. So sub pages to me help, if I have a lot of content that I need to kind of compress, I put it in its own sub page and make it its own thing versus having it all on one page. It's hard to explain without using um, uh, more examples. And then Martin had asked, what's the what's wrong with the use of color to signal something different? Um, it's, it's fine to use color to signal something different. And I'm not an accessibility expert, but I think you shouldn't only use color because folks who can't see, and then also people who are colorblind or have just different kind of eyesight, they can't detect those color differences. So you do wanna use words as well or some other way to signify the difference between um, something. But for those who are sighted, it can be a helpful thing. Um, 
oh, here, then I have uh, a syllabus as well. So here's an example of where we use the lessons tool for our syllabus. Um, and the idea being here is that basically last year I got a syllabus that was 20 pages long, literally. And I was like, okay, that's that's great. <laughs> Let's see if we can find a way to make this a little bit easier for students to, to digest. And so I use the lessons tool to break out the most important content from the syllabus. And not that all content is not important, but actually in the main course information section, which I don't show in this example, I do have a sub page that lists just some of the learning outcomes for the course that are, I think they're coming from an accreditation board um, that was literally about three pages of the syllabus. So I broke that out into its own page, but here I have your grading policy. That's what students most wanna know. Um, I have that broken out to its own thing, the instructions for the major assignments, and then also course policies like late policy, attendance policy, um, and this course had a formatting policy as well. So I'm really just trying to highlight the most important course information in the syllabus um, using the lessons tool with these expand and collapse sections. Uh, do I use lessons? And so sometimes it's sometimes I'll use lessons tool for my syllabus. Sometimes we'll use the syllabus tool. So it really just depends on how the meeting goes with the faculty member I'm working with. But regardless of what I do, I always do make a like a Word document PDF version of the syllabus, and I upload that to our homepage. We on our homepage in Sakai, we have a spot for the syllabus versus the syllabus tool. So I always make sure I have a Word document version of it as well. Um, so I'm going to jump into colors here. So um, uh, colors, like I kind of just mentioned, sometimes they can be used um, appropriate. Like they should be used appropriately. Is basically my point with colors. You have wonderful color choices in Sakai, um, and and sometimes I do see instructors who use colors kind of haphazardly. They just pick the color that feels best to them that day, and I love that for them. I love how colorful they are, but I do like to kind of restrict and kind of establish a brand for my class. Brand's not the right word, but maybe a theme. So for one, you know, actually, and I do it between semesters. So what, you know, if it's my fall course, I'll oftentimes choose orange or gold because it feels like fall colors. In spring, I'll do a, a blue or a green. Um, and that makes no sense to no one but myself, but it helps me keep track between different courses as well as I'm working on them. And then um, I'd like to kind of keep with that theme as much as possible throughout that course, or as it's shown in this course and actually in our great Sakai site that we're using for the conference, I do use colors for those section breaks to signify what's gonna be online work and what's gonna be in-person work. So in our Sakai site today, we kind of have, I think it's maybe, I'm gonna get my colors backwards, but I think it's blue sections for our content sessions. And then there's green for um, the other meetings or the or the trivia. So it's kind of trying to signify to you differences in types of material. And this in this example I'm showing here, I've kind of got red for our in-person material and then blue for the things that we're gonna be completing online. And you'll note that I write also online so that it's not just um so it, it does maintain that accessibility i also give some instructions at the top of the page saying that um the blue is meant for meant to be uh, i give a key a legend essentially at the top of the page uh next up is layouts so this is a really nice time saving feature um when i'm trying to just kind of build some some uh lessons pages very quickly so the lessons button is called or sorry the layouts button it's in lessons you just press add layout and um, so let's see, my GIFs here are kind of funny. So when you click on add layout, this one, I'm gonna show page layouts and this is sub page listing. And I can make basically a lot of different sub pages um, with the word week at the front of them. I can specify, I want 12 to be made and then I want them all to be green. So this is a helpful way for me to just really quickly populate an empty lessons page with my weeks of the semester sub pages. So that's the first, layout option that I regularly use. And then the next one, I'm sorry, my GIFs are kind of like loading at the wrong times here, but um, when I ch click on the add layout button for uh, an interior page listing, I think this one is called, I'll start it over here, here we go. So add layout, and then I go to page layouts, and then I'm gonna choose interior layout with tasks. So I get an overview section, a checklist, and then I can say I want four tasks, sections are expandable and collapsible and I want them all to be orange and I say add layout and then it's populated with my checklist my overview my learning outcomes area I still have to fill in the content of course that's the hard part really but this takes away so many clicks and it makes it so much faster for me to just start populating material for an instructor um, the next one that I regularly use uh, layout is um, this is going to give me uh, some task sections essentially so I'm going to say I want 
um, a task to be added to my page. I'm going to call it complete readings. I'm going to have it to be read. And then I want it to be two columns with the double width column on the right, make it collapsible, make it um, start close, and then that's added to the page. There's nothing else on this page. I would add more, but if I'm wanting to add lots of tasks, this is a great way to just add a bunch of different tasks that kind of have whatever layout I want. Again, this is just a time-saving, click-saving feature. Icons are the next thing I'm going to quickly discuss. So icons, I know, um, unfortunately, are probably not a feature in many folks' um, uh, CK editor, text editor, uh, but it's something that we, it's a plugin that we added to our editor. It's called Font Awesome. <laughs> and basically, I think I, yeah, I don't have a picture, but on, this, on the text editor, there's a little flag. It's not the other, it's not the anchor flag. It's just a different flag. And it opens up in a library of icons. And I use these, again, I try to be judicious with these. So I use an icon whenever there's a discussion forum, that's the bubbles the chat bubbles and then that is that matches up with the bubbles of the actual tool on the left hand tool menu and then for assignments I use the page icon and that matches up with the icon that's on the left hand tool menu for assignments again it's just drawing these maybe it makes no difference whatsoever for the students but I use it to help signify to them what kind of assignment this is if it's a discussion forum an assignment a test or quiz um whatever other feature it may be and then um that just helps to hopefully draw those connections for students so they're not questioning i mean it should be very obvious from the words but just a visual indication of what kind of assignment it is so they're not over then they don't have to think too hard about what they're expected to do um, i also use the the icons in the text editor for um different kinds of external links so a lot of times if i'm doing a youtube link i like to pull up the youtube icon from that library and um then for an article, I'll oftentimes use a purple arrow, and then I'll do a green play button for um, like podcasts. And again, I try to be consistent with my usage of these throughout a course so that if students see a purple arrow, they know it's going to be an article. Now there could be other, um, like maybe a newspaper kind of icon would be better, but sometimes I'll make a decision and then I'll regret that decision later, but then I've already gone too far. I'm not changing all the icons again. So I really like to use these icons. They're very easy to use. I can change the colors of them as well. And it makes it helpful for me to just, again, provide these indications to reduce students' cognitive load about what they're being expected to do. Um, this is the website for Font Awesome. Anyone can use these icons. There's many free ones or you're, all the icons that you could ever want really are in their free version. Um, and basically you can just click on the icon, then download it to your computer. And um, I would suggest resizing it to be the correct size. So I kind of put it down to like 20 pixels and then I'll put it in my course. Um, you'll have to kind of figure out how to recolor it on your own if you want to do that. But in fact, I'll even show you, I this I, ba I basically make a whole library for font awesome icons if I, if I can't get them in our existing library. So this is just a screenshot of my computer of all the icons that I use. They're all resized the correct way for myself. And then I, I've, I've made them the right colors and then I'll even just upload these as pictures. I'll make sure to give them an alt tag if I, if I, if I am using them, alt text for accessibility. Um, again, just to kind of visually break up the material for the course. Okay, checklists. Um, so checklists are a fantastic feature. We did interviews with students last summer um, where we go, basically go around to students asking them what's, what instructors can do to make their experience in Sakai better. And I think probably the number one thing, except for grades, were, were checklists. So students really, really, really love the checklist. There's lots of different ways to do a checklist though. So here's a few examples. I don't wanna spend too much time on any of them, but my main goals with a checklist is to be very specific so this is actually not the greatest, these are not the greatest examples of the words that I would necessarily use, but I don't wanna have a checklist that's 50 items long that's then repeated in the less, the main lessons page. I have seen that for some courses, but I, I really wanna focus on the deliverables. Sometimes I'll add a reading, sometimes I'll watch video, I'll say watch these videos, but I wanna be, I, I try to recommend to be specific about what they're actually turning in. Um, Again, that can vary for different courses. Um, sometimes I'll use this also as a way to convey the dates of the course. So I'll say all items are due by this date. Um, uh, and, and then these are just different examples you can take a look at later, but of how to incorporate the date into the checklist. Um, this one on the, this example on the right here, um, this is an option where if I don't want to have to change my dates every semester, type in these dates manually. Uh, this instructor has say, set basically there's two due dates every module, first Sunday of the module, second Sunday of the module. And here's an example where I'm being pretty specific about what my what, what 
the tasks are. And in the actual lessons menu or the lessons page, I have all the instructions for each of those tasks. Yes, please steal the date checklist idea. I'm just now looking at the chat again. So please steal that. Um, there's again, these slides I think will be linked someplace. So please feel free to steal. Um, then the questions are uh, another tool that I really love to use to build quick engagement with my students. Simple, very easy. Just click on the add content and then add question, type in a multiple choice or short answer question, and you can make it a poll if you want. Um, and so there's a correct answer here that's very obvious to me, which is that you should always fly in a capsule versus a shuttle. That's the main takeaway from today is that choose capsules over shuttles when you're going to space. It's safer. Um, and it's just a fun way to build quick engagement with your students. Um, you can also get really meaningful feedback from, from the participants in your course. So in this case, we're asking our faculty members to read an article. So this is an example of it kind of embedded into a lessons page. It's embedded right there. It's a quick question. And then we get really great feedback. This is a, you know, we're, they're writing substantive answers that then when we go to our live class session, we can refer back to these and I can point out certain students. I said, oh, you wrote a really excellent comment in your poll. Please tell it to the class um, or your question. Please tell it to the class. So I'll wrap up there. It's, there's even more features and lessons I love. I had to pick just seven. I hope I counted correctly. I think that's seven. Don't come after me. Math's not my strong suit. Um, but my key takeaway is I really love lessons. It offers so much um, functionality that I have not seen in other platforms. And I love spending my time in there and making it look beautiful and making it look uh, and making it not just beautiful, but also functional for the students and um, add, making it personal to the instructor and to the class. And I will now stop for questions. You did a great job. Thank you so much, me. And there was a, a couple of questions. I think some other people in the Participant list may have piped up and helped out as well. Like uh, Jeremy Anderson had a question: How do you change the colors on the checklist? Is that only done with CSS? Um, for us, if you change the section color, it changes the checklist color. It does the same thing with the questions tool, like that questions feature that gets changed as well. And I'm not sure if it's a feature or a bug, but for us, for it's a feature. Um, so if I just click on the little gear, the little gear icon, I change the section to be green. It will change the checklist color. <laughs> I don't have a course on how to build a submersible. <laughs> I, I wouldn't. I would not try that. <clears throat> um. I know there are some syllabus questions. I think we had one, someone asking, uh, where did it go? We only use syllabus and test and quizzes. What would you suggest as a starting point for us to begin to digitize the syllabus? Oh, um, oh, well, we have, a, we have a syllabus template that we provide to faculty. That's a Word document that is accessible, that has all the headings built in. Um, as noted, possibly by many, the, the, the expand and collapse version of it in lessons. Um, I again, I don't know about those expand and collapse sections as being accessible, but we do. We start off with our template being accessible, and then folks can just use that for their syllabus, and then just upload that as a PDF, and that should do the job. I might not have answered that question correctly. And fine, like I said, there were some others who gave some input there as well. We have, I think, one minute left. My clock's going off uh, a little bit fast here. If anyone any wants to uh, like pipe up with questions too, if I'm not seeing them in the chat. Here's a question for Wilma. It's more of a, a program notes question. So Julianne, you mentioned the slides would be linked somewhere. So Wilma, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, what are your thoughts about the best place for us to oh, link? I, I already linked them. If you look on the Sakai page, just above the link for this session where you join the session, there's a link to the slides. Um, someone asked if they could reach out to me. Yes, absolutely. I'm typing my email is jmorgan2 at udayton.edu might be a little bit kind of slow to respond for the next couple of weeks, but absolutely reach out. Okay. Thank you so much. I think we came to the end of the time. I think we have, uh, let me double check. 
per the schedule, we do have a 10 minute break. Uh, what question just snuck in here, Julianne? So Julianne, what would you want to see in the lesson changes updates? Um, I have a Google, a Google Doc where I have all my feature requests. Uh, I think I've shared that with the appropriate folks. <laughs> I think that's a request to send it to Dave, Julianne. <laughs> I think so. I'll send it to, to I'll send that along. Yep, they send him the link. Noted. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Like I said, we do see a 10 minute break before the next session. So thank you all. Thank you again, Julianne. Thank you all. All right.